For thousands of years, the sands of Egypt have drawn soldiers, scholars, and adventurers from around the world. Today, this land of hidden treasures has produced a charismatic son, a guardian of ancient secrets, and a rarely gifted archaeologist. His name is Zahi Hawass, and he holds a unique job. In his hands lie all of Egypt's monuments. This is his story. OK, I'm ready to warm up our subject. We're going to stand right here. How is that? That looks good. Is it up or down? Look up there. That's great. There we go. Ah, you're going to fly away. Good, 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 good. <laughs> Tell me the story of the pyramids. I'm the king of the pyramids. You bow in front of me. <laughs> South and west of Cairo and the pyramids lies the Sahara El Garbeya, Egypt's western desert. In the middle of this bone-dry landscape is something unexpected. Water. Bahariya Oasis, 200 miles from Cairo, has been an important settlement for thousands of years. To this day, it's a self-sufficient desert outpost. It was here in 1999 that Dr. Zahi Hawass announced his greatest discovery to the world. An astonishing series of tombs beneath the sand. He named it the Valley of the Golden Mummies. This is the beginning of a tomb. They have the steps. This is the entrance of the tomb, and therefore, this whole thing under the sand will uncover the whole tomb. The all-Egyptian team had found more than 200 mummies, many of them richly gilded from the Greco-Roman period some 2,000 years ago. Looks like a young lady. Uh, a young, beautiful lady. From the eyes and the eyebrow and the ears and uh, if you, we can think when she was alive, maybe 18, 20 years. I never thought that I would work with mummies like this. Nor could he predict the reaction that followed. It's so exciting, like an adventure. <laughs> How important would you say that? Dr. Zahi's discovery was a sensation and put him at the center of an international media frenzy. Over 100,000 copies sold. Thank you. For the first time, his passion for archaeology was revealed to a global audience. I said to myself, I found it. I found it. I found my lover, archaeology. Like his friend and fellow Egyptian Omar Sharif, Dr. Zahi is now world famous. He revels in this glory and this being known everywhere now, traveling about and being an important person. But fame and ambition don't come for free. When you are not famous, you want to be famous. But when you become famous, you will hate it. You never have a private time in your life. People always look at you. No freedom. Then you will, no one would like fame. Dr. Zahi has managed to keep his wife and two grown up sons out of the limelight, but it's taken a toll on him. 
done his talk, answering questions, writing the books, excavating, doing administration, being the ambassador of Egypt. This is really too much for me. There's sometimes I get tired. Downtown Cairo. Today, Zahi Hawass is a powerful man. He's in charge of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, and he's ultimately responsible for all of Egypt's priceless archaeological treasures. From Tutankhamun's relics to the temples at Abu Simbel and Karnak, Dr. Zahi is the gatekeeper. As the protector of this ancient heritage, he has many threats to contend with. Rampant tourism, pollution, environmental hazards, and urban sprawl. He also oversees the seemingly never-ending task of excavating, documenting, and preserving new finds. Today, at the Baharia Oasis, for example, a team is slowly uncovering another labyrinth of hidden tombs. In the coming weeks, they'll be searching for burials, perhaps a skeleton, or even a well-preserved mummy. But all the time, closely monitored from Cairo. But office work has never been Dr. Zahi's true passion. This is like my, my favorite place. The burial chamber underneath is like the bedroom of the king in his palace. The step pyramid at Saqqara is more than four and a half thousand years old. And it's one of the sites where Dr. Zahi has made major new discoveries. It's like the stairs to heaven. The king who's buried underneath is taking this as steps to go to the sun garden. This afternoon, Dr. Zahi is off duty, but his love for archaeology is never far away. With him is a friend, Sabine Huber, a Swiss diplomat. They intended in that time to find the burial chamber, and that's why they cut until they reached that. They went down the solid rock, this whole shaft, 12 meters down. They cut it until they did reach the main burial chamber of the pyramid. I'm realizing that I'm very, very lucky to have been joining around by him personally, to feel his enthusiasm and his knowledge and all what he knows. This is wonderful. So beautiful. You can see people coming out from this tomb, they're crying. It's like a story. Then the story begins. When you listen to him, it's not only listen to him, it's, it's he lives what he says because he has lived it and he has seen so many things. He communicates to you, he transmits to you like it's life. And you have people bringing, offering, they're hunting in the marshes, they're hunting birds and also they're catching fish. All of these are the idealistic life that the deceased would like to have in the afterlife. But the oldest mummy that we know of existed in Egypt is located underneath that shaft. If you will come after me, I will be sure that the curse of Nefer will not rest on you. <laughs> you can imagine how it is because he can explain with the, with the colors, with the movements, what people did. And that makes it bring him back to real life. You now this is dated back 4,300 years ago. Isn't he wonderful? You know, I believe that mummies should not be shown in museums. Mummies should be shown in their tombs. And that's why I would like to leave this mummy in that place. Back in downtown Cairo, Dr. Zahi divides his time between his main office and a second one, five miles away at Giza, in the shadow of the Great Pyramid. 
سهلة زيزو يعني ألف It's never been a place for quiet contemplation. <laughs> Dr. Zahi is busy the whole day. He doesn't have a second to spare. People and phone calls, more people, more phone calls. Nashwa Gaber, Dr. Zahi's assistant, knows him better than most. He's a straightforward person, hates lies, but at the same time, it's difficult to know what's going on in his mind. He wants you to understand and empathize with him from the expressions in his eyes. He gets angry when someone makes a mistake. When he's angry, his face turns very red and he bangs on the desk with his hand. Then his voice gets louder and he gets very aggravated. I sometimes think his ears must hurt from all the phone calls. For Dr. Zahi, protecting these ancient monuments is a heartfelt responsibility. He finds sanctuary inside the Great Pyramid itself. If anyone will ask me a question, what is the closest place to your heart? I will say this place. If I need to escape from anything, if I need to find a solution of a problem, I come to this place alone and meditate. And I close my eyes and think about the problem. Always I find a solution. Another day, and another battle with Cairo's relentless traffic. Dr. Zahi is heading out of town on family business, to the Dumyat region in the Nile Delta. Zahi Hawass was born here in 1947. Today, he's come back for a flying visit to the old family home. The king of the pyramids is viewed with a mixture of awe and affection. The root of this village and the people that we live with them, they're just like a part of your family. Everyone here I know, everyone here I met, everyone here I love. And that's why this place, which I grew up, it gave me everything in my life and I owe the people here and the village uh, all my success. This is my route and uh, what's really important if you want to be successful you never forget your route. If you forget your route you are nothing. When I go there I always remember my childhood. Running everywhere. Uh, playing soccer, football everywhere. Going in the farm, reading books, taking a boat in the Nile.
that was a very exciting childhood. Dr. Zahi's younger brother, Mohammed Abbas Hawass, still lives in the area. As children, we grew up on the farm. I always went to the farm, but Zahi didn't like going there. My father didn't get angry with him, even though he was disobedient. I was more obedient. My father uh, died when I was in the age of 13. And my father gave me two important things in my life. He taught me to be a, a brave man, never afraid of any human being. And the second thing is to be honest. Because he said if you're honest, no one can get you. Zahi was the leader on the football field. When, for example, they were choosing the teams, he did the choosing. With anything between him and his friends, they always looked up to him, and they loved him. His friends relied on him for everything. His ambition was to live in Cairo and Alexandria. And sure enough, the young Zahi soon left the village for Alexandria University. After graduating in archaeology, Zahi got his first job at the somewhat dusty Department of Antiquities in Cairo. There is no one has any kind of ambition. They sit at the offices. I didn't see any archaeological work. Then I said to myself, I do not think that I belong to this place. But a year spent out in the field changed his perspective. And I felt in love in archaeology. And from that time, I made it as archaeology to be my love. In the 1980s, Zahi Hawass studied for his doctorate in Egyptology at the University of Pennsylvania. He also went in front of the camera for the first time. Hello, my name is Zahi Hawass. I'm from Egypt, and I have been working in... Uh, the first TV show, I was not able to talk because I do not know what can I say. I was so trembled in front of the camera, which is the site that I have been working for the last six or seven years in Egypt. It is strange that 10 or 15 years ago, he had all this knowledge. And he probably was quite shy, and he probably didn't talk that much. It's extraordinary how people do develop through, through having an audience. My plans. I have lots of plans. <laughs> After seven years in America and having gained his PhD, the now Dr. Zahi had indeed relaxed a little. Continue my research on pyramids. And uh, because there is lots of sites that I like to excavate again. Uh, but maybe will be other plans that will change that. Um, I will tell you this about these plans later. <laughs> Back in the Baharia oasis, the atmosphere is electric. Dr. Zahi's team has been busy. Just half an hour ago, this ceramic sarcophagus was uncovered. It's Greco-Roman and around 2,200 years old. And even more exciting, another roughly cut out of limestone and older still. Limestone is not locally available. It must have been brought from a quarry near Cairo at some expense. The sarcophagus appears to be intact and may contain the mummy of a high-ranking official. In two days' time, Dr. Zahi will come for a first look at the new findings. For many years, tourism has been one of Egypt's largest foreign currency earners, bringing in tens of millions of dollars each year. Oh, 
People have come here to learn, to realize their dreams, and to simply gaze in wonder. But back in the 1980s and 90s, trouble was brewing for the Giza Plateau and for Zahihuas. A raft of hugely popular books and articles speculated on long disputed questions. Who built the pyramids? Why and when? In their book, Ian Lawton and Chris Ogilvy Herald described some of the theories. The pyramid being a massive energy generator, a giant water pump built by people from other planets. A mirror, the belt stars of Orion, built in 10,500 BC by the survivors of Atlantis. Power plants, hidden chambers, secret tunneling, pools of records, that kind of thing. An almighty battle quickly developed between the so-called New Ages and a furious Dr. Zahi Hawass. Why the people will say such a thing, all this legend, about the Sphinx and its dates to lost civilization. It's a legend. But the New Ages fought back. Graham Hancock is a best-selling author of alternative history. I went through several years of enmity at a distance with him uh, when, when a great deal of mud was uh, thrown in, in both directions. Um, he was, felt himself, I think, very much under attack from the alternative history brigade, which he might like to call the Pyramidians. When I began to answer them back, they made it like a battle. Zahi, I believe, was inundated with tens of thousands of letters of complaint. And indeed, an email campaign was started, and I was instrumental in it. Faxes, letters, emails, conspiracy theories uh, abounded. Are there or are there not chambers underneath the Sphinx? It was a very negative campaign. And many people around the world found it, found it very sinister caused him a lot of problems. Information was being concealed. It is not true. I don't agree with them on that. They know they're lying and covered up and, and hidden. And they began to attack me personally. It's undiplomatic because he speaks his mind. Some of them were doing this to sell their books. He was over strenuously uh, defending his position. In short, it was a mess. And it was damaging for orthodox Egyptology. But Dr. Zahi was not to be distracted. He'd always been lucky in his excavations. There was one extraordinary morning at Giza that he'll never forget. An American lady was riding a horse, and the leg of the horse fell down about three meters, discovered the small mud brick wall. What the horse discovered turned out to be no less than the site of the tombs of the pyramid builders themselves. My heart was in joy, my eyes was shining. This discovery reconstructed history. Unique scenes that we never see before. taking offerings to give it to the deceased. This was the base of a pillar that was supporting the ceiling. The way that she's holding him, love and affection. We know that pyramids only for kings and queens. No one else can build a pyramid. But now, my discovery can show pyramids began to be for everyone. If you can afford it, do it. But the king can afford it from limestone. But the workman is a poor man. He can afford this from mud bread. Then everyone now can go for the afterlife. Even the poor people can prepare the tombs for eternity, like kings and queens. In summary, Dr. Zahi suggests that the pyramids weren't built by spacemen or even slaves, but by the willing people of Egypt in honor of their kings. In his search for the truth and his ongoing discussions with the New Ages, he was supported by fellow archaeologist 
Dr. Mark Lehner. We sort of began this dialogue with the New Agers. Uh, I'm afraid that Zahi took up the uh, call to arms more than I did. I sort of retreated into, into my serious work. But Zahi has had a dialogue that it's important for legitimate archaeologists to engage these people, to understand what they're saying, and then to address what they're saying, rather than just to stiff arm them like, and ignore them completely. Now, not every scholar has to do that, but it's important that some scholars do. And Zahi does, and he does it really well. Dr. Zahi's defense of orthodox archaeology has been fueled by his passion and his imagination. If we can close our eyes and go back 5,000 years ago, we can imagine what's happening here. Welcome and coming from Upper Egypt. Get up in the morning early and they go work cutting the stones. As they're moving the stones, they come in the evening, they take their beer and bread, they dance, they sing. I feel that I'm living in the time of these people because I'm with them all the time. I understand a lot about them. Dr. Zahi's understanding is underpinned with a fierce pride in his ancestors' achievements. Egyptians gave to the world civilization, science, and technology that no one else gave. No other civilization could do that. This patriotism has prompted Dr. Zahi to bring young Egyptians into the field of archaeology. Mansour Boraik is a former pupil. You want to work with him. You want to, you love to work with him uh, for nothing, you know. And this is a unique thing in the character of Dr. Zahi. He, uh, he's uh, great, he has a great personality to let you work with him uh, for nothing. And this is good, you know. I mean, I'm not uh, talking about money or something like that, but you know, you just want to work with Zahi because you like him. And this is a unique thing in his character. Those young people will carry the same responsibility and I believe they will be better than me in defending and protecting this place. Back in downtown Cairo, it's Friday, the Islamic Day of Rest. And Dr. Zahi is heading for a favorite haunt in the Karno Khalil Bazaar. It's a place for smoking and quiet reflection. If you are successful, you will have enemies. If you are nothing, you will never have enemies. If you want to be a good archaeologist, you have to be a fighter, but a fighter in a good way. Dr. Zahi's fight with the New Ages is largely over. There's a new spirit of cooperation. In the end, uh, what, what Zahi and I decided to do was to continue uh, to disagree massively over the issues, but not to dislike one another as people. And this is what I find exceptional about Zahi Hawass. When I do something like fighting with someone, I finish it one minute after I do it. He is prepared to be friends with somebody and yet disagree with them then I can continue working, because I use every minute of my life from nine in the morning until six o'clock working. After six o'clock, it's two hours at home to relax. And after that, I go to meet my friends and we talk, and I talk about something else except archaeology. Tonight, the Mina House Hotel is hosting a dinner for Dr. Zahi and his friends. He has this talent, helping people to be friends with him so quickly. I love much people who are extroverts, and he is extrovert. What he feels, he says. He doesn't hide. He is not diplomatic. I 
like Fahi because he's a great deal of fun and he's lively and he's never boring. And what's nice is one can engage in a debate and he won't shut you up. He might yell and shout, but one can have an actual discussion and say, well, I think you're wrong. Um, and he won't sort of not speak to you ever again after that. He is one of the very few friends that doesn't miss a time to pick up the phone and say, Happy New Year, Happy Birthday, Happy whatever it is. And this is something very touching, especially for a man so busy like that. His greatest weakness is uh, his love for beauty. I will not elaborate. He's, uh, he's an outrageously uh, wonderful person. <laughs> and uh, an adventurer and uh, a uh, romantic uh, and uh, an internationalist and he is uh, an Egyptian but also a citizen of the world. One could sort of say that Zahi's weakness sometimes might be in thinking that he's right too often and um, but he is someone who is willing to listen to the other side but um, he does sometimes leap to I am right. You know my weakness is friendship. Uh, sometimes I give to the people that I trust too much. And I give my love to any woman that I like. And that's not good. You have to watch out sometimes. And that is my weakness. That I give sometimes everything to the people that I love. Time has come for Dr. Zahi to make the three-hour drive to Baharia. The team have asked him here to see the newly found sarcophagi and to make some decisions. Should they be opened? What preparatory work still needs to be completed? How long will all this take? A decision is reached. Tomorrow, Dr. Zahi leaves for a business trip to the United States. On his return in two weeks' time, he'll come back to open the sarcophagi. Until then, excavations will continue. Seattle, Washington State. Dr. Zahi is an explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, and he's here for the start of a lecture tour of the United States. I think I have a duty in my life that I want the public to understand archaeology. Across the US, there's a willing audience. Tonight, two and a half thousand people will fill the Benaroya Hall to hear Dr. Zahi. Please join me in welcoming the man National Geographic affectionately knows as Mr. Pyramid, Zahi Hawass. It's a big event, and nothing is left to chance.
you have always, when you lecture, you have to think that this is your first time, and this is why you do it good. If you make one small mistake, you can lose the audience, and if you the audience, you are finished. No, I just uh, try to take the people with me to my adventure, working with me in the excavation and feeling all the discovery that I made and lead them to understand a little bit about ancient Egypt. We've got about five minutes, so I'll come get you. Okay. okay. Before my lecture, I don't talk to anyone. It's like praying. I tremble. And uh, if, I, if you go to anything and you trust yourself and you're sure of it, you will never make it good. Please join me in welcoming the man National Geographic affectionately knows as Mr. Pyramid, Sahi Kawaz. Dr. Zahi's first tactic is to get the audience to laugh at the expense of one New Ager's strange obsession. From Los Angeles, a man came to see me and he asked, can I take a photograph of your bathroom? And I said, why? He said, everyone say, at 12 noon, you leave your office and you go to your bathroom and you go from a tunnel to the Great Pyramid. <laughs> I know that you will not see my bathroom now, but this is the bathroom. <laughs> it will be satellite all over the world. As Dr. Zahi speaks, the audience is gently transported into an ancient tomb. He's extremely passionate about what he does. He absolutely loves it, and he wants to share it with the entire world. Former student Janice Cameron has experienced the excitement firsthand. He has incredible energy and incredible enthusiasm. He really knows how to communicate that. I mean, you just see everybody in the audience is just completely absorbed at every moment. Zahi has become an actor. He's become a major star. He's an actor. So it's, it's not fiction completely. It's a little bit. There's a little bit of fiction in the sense that it's all true what he speaks about. But he's learned how to make the story better. Egypt, you know, has really magic and secret. And this is why always there is new things discovered. Thank you very much, Tom. His lectures are just so much fun. Hello, how are you? Seeing the lines and lines and lines of people that come to approach him and how he gives each person his full attention for as long as he can. Hello. It's great to work with Zai. He is impetuous, he's creative, very fun, opinionated. Just a very energetic person who loves his work immensely and can transmit that love when he speaks. I found him absolutely charming. <laughs> rascal, but a nice rascal. Hello, you're welcome. The twinkle in his eye is just amazing. His energy is unbelievable. Uh, it's the first time I hear him, and I'm very, very taken with him. Bahariya, two weeks have gone by, and the time has finally come to open the sarcophagi. A National Geographic film crew is here to record the event. Yet another tomb was discovered yesterday, with a promising looking sarcophagus inside.
The tomb itself is black from years of sewage seeping down from the bathrooms of houses above. We do not come and excavate it now. The water will damage everything. Then you will lose everything. There is many things has been lost, but at least something we can save. The feeling before a discovery like this, it is impossible to explain it to you. Because this is like discovering the unknown. I don't think there is anything exists here. Nothing. It was robbed. When they put their hand inside, they took the sarcophagus out, and they put dirt inside, and they put it back. Then no one will know anything, that anything is stolen. A disappointment. But the ceramic sarcophagus, discovered just a few weeks ago, appears to be sealed. The one that we found at the Valley of the Golden Mummies it has this fibrous style, but the face is different. Instead of paying for the mummification, they paid to make a coffin like this, but they did not cover it with linen and they did not put the mask, but the mask is already exist here. One sarcophagus to go, and potentially the most interesting. But Dr. Zahi calls for a 10-minute break. The feeling before a discovery like this, it is impossible to explain it to you. It makes me to dream with them. And I don't feel who's around me. I only think about the discovery. Just being with him is memorable. Every, he's, just, he's so present whenever you're with him. Although he's my boss in work, uh, but I feel that he's like my brother. I feel he is everything to me, a brother, a father, a friend, and a loved one, everything in one's life. His extraordinary passion for Egyptology is that I've never seen anyone so enthusiastic about any subject. And it's almost as though uh, he's identified himself with, with the pharaohs of old. It's a form of madness he's got, and he's becoming more and more mad. He's a mad professor he's getting to be. Very rare when you discover an intact sarcophagus, because you know that since antiquity, since 2,500 years ago, that no one touched this one. from that hole. He's looking at me with his eyes. Oh, uh, yes. Can you see? Hey. Yeah, I see something. <laughs> you see eyes. Maybe from this way. Oh, 
Wow. We are ready to open and find what's inside the sarcophagus. A faceless Egyptian, woken after two and a half thousand years and offering clues to an ancient life. Mums always have secret and magic that the person who died since 2,500 years ago still exists in front of us. And what we have to know, we have to know about this person, we have to study what he did. They maybe he did something good that we should do. And that's why it's very important to do archaeology because archaeology is preserving and is studying the past to understand your future. Dr. Zahi and his team will listen to the mummy's story and soon gently return it to the grave. 30 years ago, when I used to tell people that I'm an archaeologist, they never understood it. But I think now uh, they know the value of archaeology. And now there is a big change. Uh, everyone, they talk about archaeology. In the salons of Cairo, the king of the pyramids continues to hold court. In Egypt and around the world, this charismatic man has won friends and enemies, admirers and rivals. But the last word must go to his son, Karim Zahi Hawass. Where does his father get his energy from? Um, beans, Egyptian beans. <laughs> <laughs>